a serious college football coach and a serious college football program would make serious changes after catching multiple players jog on the field and quit live during the game. But maybe we're not a very serious college football university. You are Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things cowboy and cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you kindly for stopping by to make this your first listen. We're available on all of your podcasting platforms, visually as well on YouTube, Find me personally on X at All Deo State. Today, we are partially brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment matter more. And right now, you can win big with a $5 bet that'll get you $150 back in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Make sure that you visit FanDuel.com to get started today. Meanwhile, we get started in the conversation of the unfortunately quitting Cowboys. This is not just fire and brimstone coming out of a microphone. If you watch the Baylor game, although it was a better product overall, you did watch some of our best players literally give up and quit in the middle of plays. And one time, uh, Kendall Daniels gave up on a play and then kind of had to be forced to make a tackle because the other player started cramping. So why are we allowing all of this stuff to transpire? If you could go beyond the college coaches that are making moves all across the country, UCF recently has made a firing because their defensive coordinator was just not living up to expectations. And this is UCF we're talking about. Whenever you look at the the recruiting rankings, right, top 50, top whatever, whenever you're seeing Oklahoma State down there with the Rutgers of the world or actually below the Rutgers of the world or the Wake Forest or the Vanderbilts, I would imagine that you have problems. So the question right now is, why do we have so many players that are visibly quitting and why is it some of our best players, right? Guys, Kendall Daniels, was the best player in Oklahoma, a high four-star that went to A&M to come here, became a freshman All-American, and since then it's been nothing but a downgrading process to now, as I've been saying for a few weeks, why is he still playing? He clearly has been checked out for a while now, yet we keep throwing him out on the field. So since I'm the fire everybody coach, or at least I've heard that in some of my, my DMs, yeah, fire whomever is allowing this to take place because this is not the first week that we've had players quitting live in the middle of the game and not go after tackles and not sprint to the other side of the field as we are defensive linemen. I'm not saying they're quitting like some of the guys in the back end, but they're literally just getting stood straight, straight up. So either Rob Glass is not really getting some of the, the, the weight gain and the muscle metrics that we think we're getting or we're not able to make it applicable. And the conundrum for me there is Greg Richmond. Maybe he had some disagreements with the 335 or the iteration of it that we were going to bring in. Maybe the developmental side of the thing was downgraded from 2021. So we move on. We get Paul Randolph, who has 25 years of experience, 22 years specifically with the defensive linemen, and yet they keep going backwards. How do we get somebody who's been an SEC coach of the year at one point in time come in and we get? progressively worse every single game at the defensive line some of this just doesn't make any sense and i will say it if this is brian nardo's decision then yeah he should probably go anybody that is uh, allowing this to take place needs to go and i don't know what it is why are we letting upperclassmen play even though they're clearly not giving the same amount of effort and they're clearly not doing the same things that some of the younger guys are have been willing to do And then once again, when we get young guys out there, they're able to produce, they're able to do something. And then we have Mike Gundy come out and continuously tell us that the young guys aren't ready or for whatever reasons. When it comes to quarterback, we all know if Mike Gundy says somebody's not ready, that's wrong. That dude's ready. So if he's saying that Mayu Luyake Smith isn't ready, we know that Mike Gundy is wrong and Mayu Luyake Smith is ready to play. Who gives 13 hoots if he's a freshman? Look at the season. Look at the, the, the progression of this year. And the fact that we're trending the wrong way, it's exacerbated by it visibly being obvious that some of the dudes on the team have checked out, yet they're still starting and they're still playing significant minutes. Why do you have so many difficulties in recruiting 
And then whenever you get a decent class and you get some studs in the class that are able to potentially help us maybe get to a bowl game, it's absolutely maddening that that is even a conversation. We are dead last place. And yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll cover it in segment three, but you know Boone Pickens is literally rolling over in his grave right now because of the product we're putting out on the field. Never once in a million years did he anticipate spending half a billion dollars and it equating us being 16th place. Yet here we are. The biggest issue is that our coaches are burying their head in the sand. And our fearless leader, Mike Gundy, and he might be the main culprit of the bunch, right? because he keeps telling everybody, including the recruits, that everything is fine. There's nothing to see here. Everything's going to continue to do what it does in Stillwater. But whenever it's doing this, we have no answers. We have no justifications. We, we have no reasonings. And we clearly have no direction in how to fix it. So it's kind of hard to get on the fire anybody trained to some degree because at the end of the day, Somebody's pulling the strings here, right? Let's just call a spade a spade. I would imagine that Brian Nardo knows for the last couple of weeks he's coaching for his job. So I would also imagine that if Brian Nardo knows that he's coaching for his job, that he wouldn't be putting players out on the field just because they're upperclassmen. Yet that continues to happen. So does anybody really think that Brian Nardo has the control to tell Mike Gundy, I'm not going to play Kendall Daniels. I'm going to play a true freshman. I can guess, or I can bet you can guess the answer. The answer is going to be absolutely not. There's no way that Brian Nardo has the pool to tell Mike Gundy what we are or are not going to do and who we are and are not going to play. And this might be the downside to NIL. When everybody comes together and Oklahoma State is able to capitalize on the NIL and get all of the guys back, could it be complacency? Maybe. But if it's complacency by the players, then it has to start somewhere. There's no way that we have all of these coaches that are really all just this bad. It's not about the, the Jimmys and the Joes, X's and O's, right? We've all heard that before. But it, it takes two to tango. And a coach's job is simply to put a players in the best positions to be successful. But the players themselves, if they don't want to be out there, and you know they're not going to give max effort because you have three weeks of film that say, oh, that guy quit in the middle of play. Oh, so did that guy. Why do I have four dudes jogging down the field live during a play? This has been happening, but we just keep brushing it under the rug. And by we, I mean the coaching staff at Oklahoma State. So I am at a point now that I'm willing to fire whomever, even if it's my Gundy, because somebody is allowing this stuff to take place. Somebody is making the decisions to play all of the upperclassmen, regardless of who's better suited to be out on the field. Somebody's making these decisions. And I highly doubt that it's Brian Nardo or Casey Dunn. Should either of them be retained at this rate? No. I mean, definitely not Casey Dunn. We have a long history of Casey Dunn. Uh, we, we know what he can provide. This is is what it is. Same with Dickey, McIndoo. Uh, I know the guys still be, believe in Retay, just like the guys still believe in Nardo. So, again, let the guys who know in practice that they're not half-assing it and they're able to able and capable of helping this thing get turned around. The idea of us missing a bowl game is just, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think we would ever have that problem ever again. So when everybody says you can't get rid of a, a Mike Gundy type of character because you're going to go down, like down to what? There's only 16 teams in the league and we're 16th. And he's refusing to correct this and adjust this and fix this. And he talks to all of us like we're stupid. We know nothing. We deserve nothing. We should all just be happy that he rolls out a team. We should just be happy that we continue to play the sport of football. It doesn't make any sense. And giving NIL dollars collectively doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense for your top player. That's right. The NIL that is changing the game because it's not the big, you know, conglomerate collective type of thing. You can individually select players that you want to highlight and make sure that they're getting some NIL love. And this season, up to this point, 
Roy has pulled over $20,000 to support players. Micro deposits obviously can lead to massive changes. Unlike the big collectives, you know exactly where your support is going, and you even receive exclusive content like personal videos and updates after the season from those specific players. The best part is it's risk-free. If the athlete transfers or doesn't deliver the content, you get all your money back. This week, we're supporting Deshaun Brown. Why? Because he was one of the top 15 highest-graded defensive ends in PFF a week and a half ago, and he didn't even really play all that much against Baylor. I find it kind of perplexing. But when he is out there, thankfully, he's not one of the dudes, you know, cashing it in and, and jogging. So just help me pitch it in. I just pitched in 100 bucks for Deshaun Brown. I'd love for you to join me as well. Again, $10 makes a big difference. Let's show Deshaun the love for him, keep him connected, and make him realize that we see you out there trying to do the daggone thing still, right? Do not miss out on Roy's exciting giveaway as well. Win two tickets to a game in November. All you have to do is download Roy, create an account, and use referral code locked on, and you're entered. If you're already on Roy, any contribution to an athlete's campaign will get you entered automatically. There's no purchase necessary. Void or prohibited. Download Roy now and join the NIL game with no subscriptions and fees. And be sure to check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and X. At Roy underscore R-O-Y. Return on you for more information. Support the players individually that can help change the game collectively. Brian Nardo. My guy, this is this is bad, buddy. I, I I know the excitement level and recruiting and the youth and your path here was all a, a really good story, and a lot of people I think believe that you were going to be able to take this three three five that has kind of caught fire over the last five or six years and turn it into something pretty special, very reminiscent of what you've seen out of Iowa State. But it just has not happened. And the most head-scratching part of this whole thing has been, again, why are players playing when they're visibly failing repeatedly on film? If that is a Brian Nardo decision, then, yeah, he should probably go. My only caveat to that would be, again, I don't think Brian Nardo has a whole lot of decision-making process and who's going to play and who is not going to play. Perhaps it's the guys who got NIL is going to play. Perhaps it's simply if they've been here for three, four years, I don't care if they're talented enough, they're still going to play. Regardless of what it is, something is happening. And if it is, in fact, Brian Nardo allowing this and making these decisions, then the, inept the ineptitude definitely needs to go grow his wings elsewhere. I mean, I think it does suck because you're going to lose some dudes in the recruiting trail that Brian Nardo has been able to bring on board. But at the same time, the guys that Brian Nardo has brought in as freshmen that have made an impact whenever they do get out on the field, they're not getting enough opportunities. So does it even really matter? Does Ryan, Brian Nardo's recruiting class from last season, the guys like Landon Cleveland and David Cabongo, who are actually getting out there and getting some play, are they going to be able to show us anything if there is some micromanagement going on? Because I'll, I'll say Tone Bloom in the face, whomever is allowing these dudes to keep playing and starting when we have multiple weeks of evidentiary proof that this isn't going to work. Some dudes aren't just bought in anymore. I mean, offensively, of course, you could see it visibly that the Allen Bowman experiment did not go so well. It hasn't gone well, and it's not going to get miraculously better. Although he did have a decent performance to some degree, uh, against Baylor, the the some degree thing is we got to remember out of Brennan Presley's 170 yards receiving, almost 130 of them were at the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage. Therefore, it was pretty much the Brennan Presley show, right? There, there wasn't a lot of vertical passing game. It was a lot of typical you know five yard and under style of routes, but nonetheless, it was effective. So maybe you got to give a little bit of a kudo here to Casey Dunn because. I got to give uh, Alan Bowman this. He didn't try to overcomplicate the game. Now, he made things somewhat complicated, but at the same time, he didn't overcomplicate it. He did take the stuff that was there. By and large, it was Brennan Presley, of course, but the Brian Nardo thing, 
it's the most frustrating issue is the lack of any fixing, right? Last year, what made Brian Nardo exciting about year two was there was about five games where his you know changes in the second half resulted in turnovers in the fourth quarter that won us several ball games. So the philosophy for me was if he can take what he can do in fourth quarters and find a way to apply it for an entire game, we're going to have a really good defense. But we've regressed. In year two under Brian Nardo, it's it's gone backwards. So is it the personnel? Is it the groupings? Is it the, the style of defense? Is it not having the right guys? Is it micromanage and being forced to play certain guys whenever you don't think – that, that, that may be the best fit. And the evidentiary proof of that might be the fact that, you know, Casey Dunn seemed to be over the Alan Bowman show as well and was ready to move on to Garrett Rangel. Clearly, he was told not to do that until um, BYU. And then we saw a completely different team, a completely different offense, a completely different motivation factor. So, and now we're hearing that Mayo, Mayo Luiake Smith is ready but not ready. What are we doing? And Brian Nardo, you are coaching for your job, man. So if there is somebody telling you you have to play that guy, maybe you should say respectfully, I'm not going to do it anymore. Either fire me today or let me play the guys that I think give us the best opportunity. Maybe not even the best opportunity to win, but the best opportunity to be successful and look competent. Like, what are you saying right now? For weeks, allowing players to literally jog on the field in the middle of the game while they're, quote-unquote, chasing people down. Like, this is not what we saw in 2021. I know that was Jim Knowles, and it was a different time. But if you go back and look at 2021, athletically, we didn't have the guys we have now, right? Size, speed, athleticism. We didn't have all the dudes we have now. But we had relentless effort, and we, we could tackle. Guys, I have one leg and only one functioning arm at the moment, and I can tackle better than some of our guys that were out there. I only have one leg, and I could hop faster pretending to try to, you know, tackle somebody than some of our guys are out there. So the problems that we have in Stillwater are obviously far deeper than just not having enough talent or just not having the right game plan or the right scheme. This is an effort thing, and the effort has gone down. It's been going down for weeks, right? Which is why we had the conversation of the guys are prepared to play for Garrett Rangel. And then you saw a different team, right? You saw that. So maybe the same thing is applicable on defense. I mean, Justin Wright's not 100%, so maybe we don't jump on him for not being completely full speed. But for a lot of these other guys, it's inexcusable. So if you know you have somebody that's NFL size, speed, strength, but it's just not working, then stop, okay? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, when it's broke, you got to fix it. This has been the most maddening season uh, that I can recall. And I tell you, it, it's getting to the point where it's so debilitating from a morale standpoint that I'm, I'm not quite there yet, but I feel like I'm getting close to getting like some of the old school people that say, well, you can't find our Gundy because we'll never find anybody better. I don't subscribe to that entirely, but at the same time, it's like, well, Chad Weiberg ain't doing nothing. My Gundy ain't doing nothing. The university seemingly is doing nothing. We're losing commits. We're losing ball games. We're having kids quit live in the middle of games. We're not playing some of the underclassmen that can grade out higher than some of the upperclassmen. Like, it, it almost feels purposeful, right? I know it's not, but somebody's dropping the ball and somebody's not being held accountable, which is allowing this disaster to continue to take place. And, and that's the most troubling part, possibly, is guys. The underclassmen who have been you know, beating their head against the wall and going to class and trying to adjust a college lifestyle and learn the playbook and 
and go through the body by glass system and stay somewhat healthy that have done all of that up to this point. And they've been watching on film some of the quote unquote best players at Oklahoma State literally just stop running in the middle of the field, in the middle of a play over and over again. And they keep starting. So we might be worried about recruiting, and we should be. But we need to be more worried about retention of the freshmen because we have 35 some odd, 34, 36 ish seniors that are likely all gone for the most part anyways. We have 16 redshirt juniors that could be gone. So that's a large chunk of your roster that is gone, right? Because you're talking sixth-year, seventh-year guys. So you're supposed to be able to count on the youth to fill that void for the next season, but we're not getting to see the youth. We're playing the guys who are sucking and quitting and, and this is the representation we want to send out to recruits and freshmen. If you come to Oklahoma State, you don't have to go full speed. You don't have to show up on time to all of the film and all of the practices. You don't have to. That's the example that we're setting right now. And it's just, it's absolutely mind-blowing to me that we're here. And Chad Weiberg, continuously is is letting my gundy go in front of press conferences i haven't listened to the latest one but i owe you guys an ex extra episode so i'm going to listen to it and then give you another one but i've already gotten some messages that you know gundy's back on his bs again so i'm assuming it's you know the, the, well, and i did get a comment about my Luiake smith isn't going to play because he's not ready Although if Alan Bowman got hurt, then he would play because then he would be ready. I don't know. I need to listen to it. Not that I can make a distinguishment on what is flipping happening in Mike Gunny's brain right now. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know you can possibly make some money. If you like making money, then you're going to love FanDuel. And right now, I know the Cowboys haven't exactly been giving us a bunch of stuff that we can get excited about in the betting department, but that's okay because the NFL is here to save the day. It's America's number one sports book, and right now you can bet 5 bucks and get $150 back in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get that tingling sensation that something crazy is about to happen and the game's about to get flipped up on its head, you can check out the latest stats, view the live play-by-play, -play, and so much more from the same page where you place your best from. Make sure that you visit FanDuel.com to get started today or FanDuel.com to join today. You will get started with 150 bones back in bonus bets if your first $5 bet is a winner. That is FanDuel.com. Never waste that tingling sensation in your loins that something crazy is about to happen when you can capitalize on it with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Go get your money right. Speaking of getting your money right, we did not get Boone Pickens' money right. And, you, and somebody sent this to me in regards to Mike Gundy's uh, press conference thing. But this was, he said, hey, Cody, interesting quote. From 2020, Mike Gundy said this. The fan base needs to know this. They need to hear the end of the clip. If you want to help OSU football, come to the games. If you want to help OSU recruiting, come to the games and be supportive. And trust that I will do my job, the coaches will do their jobs, and the players will do their jobs. If not, I, Mike Gundy, will fix it. That's a quote from Mike Gundy in 2020. Yet here we are in 2024, a year after a Big 12 title game appearance, removed from two of the last three Big 12 title game appearances, and we're 16th place. A number that I honestly did not think that I would ever speak on this show. Like week one, week two, okay, maybe you could be last place, right, because you haven't had enough games in conference yet but i never once thought we'd be week six week seven week eight in and having a conversation about oklahoma state even being close to last place yet here we are so sorry boone pickens 
for, I don't want to say wasting everything, but thus far we are wasting it. And does anybody think that in the new landscape of college football that we're doing any favors to ourselves by going the way that we're going? Like Boone Pickens had a vision that Oklahoma State football would be one of the perennial contenders in the Big 12 year after year. And because of that, the success in football via Mike Gundy would make every sport financially able to be much more competitive and successful as well. But we're literally just peeing down our leg and pooping it all away. I, I don't disagree with Mike Gundy in that position, that if college football is successful at your university, then financially it'll all take care of itself, enrollment, everything will tick up, so your other sports are going to have the opportunity to be better as well. I agree with that. But how crazy is it that some of the same things Mike Gundy says he believes in, he's now years later or weeks later or months later, hypocritically completely turn it around. We owe more to the fan base and to Boone Pickens than what we're, we're getting. And furthermore, we owe some semblance of a conversation or an explanation or you know, do what most college football teams in the country do that are serious about being competitive and prove a point. Fire somebody who's failing miserably. And you know what? Obviously, I, I was in over my skis on the, 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 the Dickey firing. And you know what? It's probably stupid of me to believe that Mike Gundy would actually do something that drastic to change everything. But when do we start having a conversation of who's failing the most? I don't know that it's just the coordinators. I don't know that it's just the players. We have an individual in Mike Gundy who I thought revolutionized his way of doing things last season. Evidently, that is not the case. And what's more maddening from the Boone Pickens perspective is the, uh, the, the defiance to just call a spade a spade, tell everybody that we are failing, the areas that we're failing in, and how they are fixable. There's a lot of coaches that value the fan experience. My gunny is not one of them, and that's okay. As long as he's winning, you can't treat the players like they're all weak. You can't treat every commit or potential commit or a decommit as, you know, useless and not loyal and true. While also telling everybody that everything is fine and we're good. It just doesn't work. You cannot alienate the fan base and some recruits and some players, former players, whatever while also being dead last place that, that, that you can't do. Again, if you're going to be a Nick Saban-esque hard ass, fine. It's just got to be worth it, right? You have to prove to the recruits and the players and the fans and the parents and the families that coming to Oklahoma State still means something because we can do X, Y, and Z. We're in rebuild mode, but the only body who's refusing to acknowledge that is Mike Gundy. It's a problem. But now, let me go listen to my Gundy, and let's see if this next show's a little bit more fired up. It might be. Maybe it should be. I don't know. What I do know is that's all we're going to have for this one right here. I appreciate you all being patient with me. Um, yeah, I've got some minor stuff going on, but we'll get it knocked out here before too long. Until um, the next one, which will be here fairly quickly. I appreciate you all. God bless. Go Pokes. Thank you for tuning in to make this your first listen here in Locked On Oklahoma State. You could be anywhere. So happy you choose to be here. Like it if you like the daggone thing. Dislike it if you don't. That's okay too. More importantly, share, comment, and subscribe my podcast. People out there, you're the bricks, the bread, the butter, the fountain, the foundation, the fondue, fondue, whatever. You know what it is. You're all of it. I appreciate you. Hit Starsley Review. Do what you do. Later, my taters.